In today's episode of The Situation Room, we're navigating a global landscape brimming with even more tension and uncertainty. Our lead story takes us to the Korea Peninsula, where alarming analysis suggests that Kim Jong-un might be on the brink of a war, a move that could reshape regional dynamics and also global politics. We'll dissect the evidence and the implications of such a drastic decision. Then we'll shift to volatile waters of the Red Sea, where we dive into the intensifying conflict between coalition forces and Yemen's Houthi rebels. The tit for tat exchanges of missile strikes and drone attacks signify a dangerous escalation with far reaching consequences for regional stability and international maritime security. And then we pivot to the bitter winter battlefields of Ukraine, where a significant aerial victory against Russian forces marks a pivotal moment in the ongoing conflict. The downing of critical Russian aircraft not only symbolizes Ukraine's resistance, but also raises questions about the future of warfare and strategic military operations. And finally, we go to Mexico, where cartel violence reaches new heights with the advent of drone strikes. Join us as we explore these pressing issues in this week's Situation Room. So first, our lead story. As claims go, it was one of the most dramatic in recent months. On January the 11th, specialist North Korean blog 38 North dropped an urgent new essay on the Hermit Kingdom. Written by a pair of seasoned analysts, Robert L. Carlin and C. Crit S. Hacker, it contained a shocking conclusion. The war on the Korean Peninsula is now inevitable. In Carlin and Hacker's view, Kim Jong-un has already decided to attack South Korea. The only question is when. To quote them, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is more dangerous than it has been at any time since early June 1950. That may sound overly dramatic, but we believe that, like his grandfather in 1950, Kim Jong-un has made a strategic decision to go to war. Given that a second Korean War would be a historical disaster, this naturally made the world sit up. And while many analysts disagreed with Carlin and Hecker's interpretation, their essay certainly highlighted one important fact. Over the last year, Pyongyang has begun acting in ways that look a whole lot like it's preparing for conflict. The examples used in 38 North include stuff like a steady drip of propaganda that seems to be conditioning the populace for a coming war. But there's other evidence out there too. On the rhetorical side, you have the dramatic speech Kim Jong-un made at the end of 2023, a speech in which he demanded an exponential increase in Pyongyang's nuclear arsenal, accused the US and South Korea of plotting an invasion, and warned, quote, war can break out at any time on the Korean Peninsula. This Tuesday, the tyrant followed up these threats with even more specific ones, changing the constitution to name South Korea the number one hostile state and saying, we don't want war, but we have no intention of avoiding it. Now, to be fair, this is Kim Jong-un we're talking about here. Saber rattling and melodramatic threats are the very definition of on brands for the man. What's different this time is that these threats are being accompanied by concrete action. That included the abrupt closure this week of ministries responsible for Korean reunification, an act that effectively ended the North's multi-decade commitment to creating a single Korean state. It's a sea change in official policy. But it also included worrying stuff like missile launches and the development of new weapon systems. On January the 14th, for example, Pyongyang claimed that it had tested what Time magazine called a new solid fuel intermediate range missile tipped with a hypersonic warhead. Now, the goal of this missile seems to be to evade air defenses and accurately strike American bases on Guam. But it's not the only weapon Kim's concentrating on. Deutsche Welle reports that back in December, the North tested what it claimed was a, quote, nuclear-capable intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, that could reach anywhere in the US. This is what we mean when we say North Korea's recent actions may indicate a growing threat. Actions that also include a new nuclear reactor coming online that the International Atomic Energy Agency believes could be used to produce weapon-grade fuel. Of course, all of this could still be bluster. North Korea has followed a fairly predictable cycle of threats, reconciliation, and then more threats for decades now. As Professor of International Relations Garen Malloy told DW, calls to arm for war are not unusual in North Korea. We shouldn't be smug that this is meaningless, but nor should we imagine that it means war. Still, Let's imagine for a moment that this time is different, that Robert L. Carlin and Secret S. Hacker are right. And these threats are not the usual bluster, but they are real and they are dangerous. If that is the case, then there's a question that we need to ask. Why now? Why would the Kim Jong-un of 2024 be more inclined to conflicts than the Kim of 2001 or 2017? The answer may lie in an accidental meeting of past grievances with present good fortune. 
First, the good fortune. Kim has had the blind luck to preside over a pandemic that isn't deadly enough to collapse his regime, but is still deadly enough to justify increased repression. It sounds strange to say. I mean, after all, North Korea in the late 2010s was already a brutally repressive state. But analysts believe that Kim used pandemic-era lockdowns and mass surveillance to institute restrictions that would have been unthinkable five years ago. The once porous border with China is now mostly shut. Crimes that would have gotten you a fine in 2019, like watching pirated South Korean shows, now result in execution. The result has been a strengthening of the regime. One helped by a food crisis that has left much of the regular population too malnourished to resist, but not hungry enough to start dying en masse. As fellow at the University of Vienna's European Center for North Korean Studies, Peter Ward told the Financial Times, quote, The regime now is much more secure than when Kim came to power in 2011. At the same time, Global events have conspired to gift the North more allies than ever. With Russia under Western sanctions for its war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin is willing to materially support Pyongyang in exchange for shells. China, meanwhile, wants as many regional allies as possible for the looming showdown over Taiwan, so is even less interested than usual in reining Kim in. So, well, that's the good fortune side of things. But what about the past grievances? It's this part that makes up the core of Carlin and Hecker's essay for 38 North. The true change, they argue, isn't Kim's recent bellicosity toward the South, rather it's the shift in mindset that preceded it. In the two analysts telling, Pyongyang's policy from the early 1990s until 2019 was one of trying to normalize relations with the United States. Now, initially, this approach seemed to bear fruit. From 1994 to 2002, the agreed framework kept the two nations on a common, if bumpy, path toward a future where the North could have nuclear power in exchange for giving up reactors that could be used to produce weapons. Even after the framework collapsed and relations plunged into the septic tank, Carlin and Hecker argue that Pyongyang's goal remained to restart talks with the Americans. This was an approach that seemed to pay off in 2018 when President Donald Trump suddenly ditched a policy of taunting Kim on Twitter for one of diplomacy. What followed were the glory days for Kim Jong-un. When he and Trump met in Singapore in mid-2018, it seems like a brighter future for Pyongyang and Washington really was possible. Unfortunately, that brightness turned out to be an illusion. Less a false dawn and more just a case of the whole world squinting into the darkness and willing to see sunbeams. The total collapse came in February 2019, when the Hanoi summit between Kim and Trump ended in failure. According to Carlin and Hecker, to quote, Kim poured his prestige into the second summit in Hanoi. When that failed, it was a traumatic loss of face for Kim. So bitter was this failure that the analysts believe it left Kim convinced that relations could never be normalized with America. If that was the case, why should the tyrant bother showing any restraint at all? This is the toxic background, the 38 North essay identifies, one in which North Korea's leadership no longer sees any need to play nice and believes that American power is waning. To be clear, this has been a hotly debated take. While Carlin and Hecker are respected analysts, other respected analysts have dismissed their conclusions as hyperbole. The Lowy Institute's interpreter blog did a whole article countering their claims. On the other hand, we're currently living in a world where tyrants often do the unimaginable, where Russia really does launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, where Azerbaijan really does overrun Nagorno-Karabakh in a lightning assault. So rather than dismiss Carlin and Hecker, we're going to try and engage in what it might mean if they're right. What it might mean if Kim really has decided to reunify Korea by force. Now, the first thing to note here is that we probably wouldn't see war coming until it was too late. The basic problem for the North is that South Korea is militarily superior. And South Korea, backed by Japan and the United States, is so superior that it could quickly turn the Hermit Kingdom into a pile of smoking rubble kingdom. That means the only chance Kim has to level the playing field is to open any conflict with a massive surprise attack. One so overwhelming it knocks out Seoul and Tokyo and so shocks Washington that the US is convinced to stay out of the fight. And it's here where things get really rather scary. Back in 2017, at the height of US-North Korea tensions, director of the East Asian Non-Proliferation Program, Jeffrey Lewis, wrote about Pyongyang's use-it-or-lose-it weapons. These are weapons like nuclear warheads that will be number one on the strike list for any counterattack. Rather than start with conventional weapons and build up, Kim therefore has to use his nukes in the opening hours of any conflict or risk losing that option. Hence the doomsday scenario Lewis outlined in the Washington Post, one in which the North opens with a surprise nuclear attack on American bases in South Korea, Japan, and Guam, an attack that would kill tens of thousands of US soldiers in the hopes of terrifying Washington into staying out of the fight. 
Now, obviously, the chances of that working are near zero. Lewis calls it a desperate gamble. But that doesn't mean Kim might not roll the dice if he thought it was his only chance to win. Now, thankfully, this is still just a hypothetical scenario, and in the spirit of keeping things balanced, we're going to end this section not with a dark warning about the future, but with the reasons why other analysts believe a second Korean War is unlikely anytime soon. Now, the first most obvious point is that the logic of deterrence still holds. Rather than use them or lose them weapons, the North's nukes might be better understood as use them and then lose everything. Kim knows a nuclear attack would unleash a massive military response, one that would end in his death and the complete destruction of his regime. Likewise, a conventional assault on the South runs slap into the problem that Seoul and its allies are militarily superior. As the interpreter notes, North Korea cannot coerce the South with nuclear weapons because Seoul and Washington can dismiss those threats due to the high cost of a nuclear exchange and the imbalance of the conventional military power in the South's favor. At the same time, the North can't be sure that its allies have its back. For all their anti-Western rhetoric, it's worth noting that Moscow and Beijing have not yet dared start a war with the US, probably because they know they'd lose. As Tokyo-based international relations expert Ryo Hinata Yamaguchi told DW, while the North might rely on Moscow and Beijing for support, they do not trust them enough to be confident they would come to the North's aid in the event of a war. And finally, there's the fact that a war could derail what has so far been a pretty good decade for Kim. Right now, Pyongyang has money and military expertise flowing in from a desperate Russia. Trade with China is returning to a pre-pandemic level. World leaders like Vladimir Putin are showing Kim a level of respect beyond what the tyrant is used to. In short, life is good for the dictator. Would he really be willing to throw it all away for a war that he must know that he can't win? Laid out like that, it seems probable that there won't be renewed conflict on the peninsula, that despite Karl Inneheger's warnings, this latest round of threats is as empty as ever. Or is it? One key element of the analyst's essay is that Kim, like Vladimir Putin, believes American power is in retreat, that Western authority and military might is draining away, and that this retreat Will lead to unexpected opportunities. This could come in the form of the West failing in Ukraine, or perhaps a US election so rancorous that it leads to widespread violence, or maybe a dozen other things that we can't foresee. As one analyst told DW, any sign of weakness by the West in the Middle East, Ukraine, or elsewhere could give him the impression that this may be an unrepeatable opportunity too good to pass up on. If that happens then, Decades from now, historians will look back at Carlin and Hecker's essay for 38 North and wonder how they predicted the future with such horrifying accuracy. Next up, we move to the Red Sea, where a prolonged operation to rein in Yemen's Houthi rebel organization has recently intensified and where Houthi forces have chosen not to back down, but to step up their own offense in return. The current round of escalation has been on the horizon for some time, but to hear the Houthi rebels themselves tell it, the current uptick in violence stems from one critical moment on December the 31st, 2023. On that day, a group of about a dozen Houthi rebels riding in four small boats attempted to attack a massive container ship flying the flag of Singapore known as the Maersk Hangzhou. The attack followed an incident earlier in the day in which the Maersk Hangzhou reported that it was struck by a missile and an American destroyer, the USS Gravely, had moved into the Maersk Hangzhou's vicinity to assist. In a later, larger attack, the Maersk Hangzhou was first targeted by two anti-ship ballistic missiles, which the US Gravely shot down. Then came the four small attack boats whose Houthi passengers attempted to board the container ship. The USS Gravely obviously didn't take kindly to that. And assisted by helicopters dispatched from the USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier, they responded to the Maersk Hangzhou's distress call. After verbal warnings didn't seem to have much effect, the American naval helicopters fired on the Houthi boats, sinking three of the four and killing the rebels on board. The fourth boat attempted to flee the area, and it was not pursued. Now, as an international observer sitting on the outside of the conflict, you might be thinking to yourself, well, the Houthis sent their boats to try aboard a cargo ship while they knew the US military was in the area. <laughs> what did they possibly expect? And to that, we say, well, fair enough. But the Houthis appear to have seen this one differently. That was made clear on January the 10th, when a massive wave of 21 drones and missiles flooded into the Southern Red Sea. This was by far the largest single attack by the Houthis since they'd started their drone and missile attacks a few months ago, and Houthi military spokesman Yahya Suri was quick to explain why such a large attack had happened. According to him, the wave of missiles and drones was a, quote, preliminary response to the US action to kill those 10 members of the Houthi boarding party a little over a week prior. 
While no one was hurt and no damage was reported in the January 10th wave of attacks, they were nonetheless taken as an attempt by the Houthis to throw their weight around. Days earlier, the Houthis had stated that America should hand over the Navy seamen who were responsible for the deaths of the Houthi boarding party so that they could face prosecution in Yemen. And while before the January 10th wave of attacks, that statement might have been just laughed off, it now put into context the idea that the Houthis seemed to believe the old adage that don't poke the bear didn't apply to them. Now, we are going to explain what happened next, but we imagine at this stage, you probably saw it coming. Two days later, on January the 12th, the United States and the United Kingdom engaged in a joint missile strike on a massive scale, using both Tomahawk missiles launched from warships and submarines and air-to-surface missiles launched by fighter aircraft. The US Air Force Mideast Command claimed 60 successful strikes on a total of 28 targets, including, quote, command and control nodes, munition depots, launching systems, production facilities, and air defense radar systems. Said US President Joe Biden about the assault, these strikes are in direct response to unprecedented Houthi attacks against international maritime vessels in the Red Sea, including the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles for the first time in history. From a functional perspective, the US and UK strikes targeted the apparatus the Houthi rebels have built in order to carry out their missile strikes, with the goal quite clearly being to destroy that apparatus and render the Houthis toothless in the long term. Five Houthis were reported killed in the strikes, and while high-ranking Houthis promised retaliation, no additional missile and drone attacks registered from the Houthis for several days. But despite what the US and the UK might have hoped, the Houthis didn't stay quiet for long. On the 14th of January, an anti-ship cruise missile was shot down while en route to the USS Laboon, an American naval ship. A day later, another anti-ship missile, this time a ballistic missile, struck the US-owned, US-operated Gibraltar Eagle, which was, at that time, flying the flag of the Marshall Islands. The ship sustained only minor damage and no reported injuries, but the takeaways were telling. Not only had the Houthis decided to attempt another strike, but they had targeted an American ship, and they'd successfully hit it too. Houthi spokesman Sari, who we mentioned just a moment ago, made no bones about the fact that the Houthis had targeted an American vessel. As US statements had indicated even prior to these new attacks, the Houthis were never believed to have been completely declawed in the first round of coalition airstrikes. Those, according to US officials, destroyed under one third of the Houthis' overall offensive capabilities. The hope, most likely, was that the Houthis might choose to cut their losses and save face before losing everything they had in follow-up attacks. However, the US had no such luck. From there, the tit for tat continued. On January the 16th, the United States launched another strike into Yemen, taking out four Houthi anti-ship ballistic missiles that the US had alleged were being prepared for imminent attacks. On that same day, news circulated that a January the 11th raid on a ship off the coast of Somalia, carried out by US Navy SEALs, had revealed a variety of smuggled weapons, including ballistic missile warheads and anti-ship missiles smuggled to the Houthis by Iran. That raid, by the way, led to an accident on board the ship Coming back in the other direction, the Houthis struck a bunk carrier owned by Greece and flagged to Malta, which was empty but sailing to Israel when it was hit. At the time of writing, that Malta-flagged carrier, the Zagrafia, is the last ship known to have been targeted by the Houthis, but we'd hazard a guess that there have been multiple additional strikes by the time that you see this video. As this violence continues to spiral upward, it's not yet clear where either side will move next. The United States, the United Kingdom, and the broader Western coalition in the Red Sea certainly do have the capability to strike the remainder of the Houthi organization's missile launch infrastructure, but how long that'll be the case is difficult to say. According to unnamed US officials interviewed by the New York Times, American and other Western intelligence are having a difficult time in identifying Houthi targets inside Yemen, largely owing to years spent declining to build intelligence ties in Yemen and focusing on the cultivation of assets elsewhere. Now, without reliable eyes and ears on the ground, and without much previously collected data to rely on, the United States is forced to operate using signals intelligence, like satellite imaging and military flyovers, which of course have their own intelligence value, but they don't tell the complete story. Not only that, but the Houthis have the ability to hide their munitions and command posts anywhere throughout their territory, and not having human intelligence on the ground means that at times the Houthis could conceivably hide a bunch of anti-ship missiles as simply as by putting a tarp over them. Making the situation even more complicated for the coalition, it's not unlikely that the Houthis will have since moved around their assets that survived American and British attacks thus far. This moves any future strikes into the realm of what the United States calls dynamic targeting, meaning keeping close watch for when temporarily hittable targets pop up and striking them before they disappear. And it's not as if the Houthis are operating on their own either. Declassified American intelligence has indicated that Iran has been supplying information to guide the Houthis' attacks on commercial and merchant shipping picking their targets and guiding the Houthis on deciding when, where, and why to attack. 
Granted, that doesn't always seem to be easy for Iran. The Houthis are quite independent of Iran, unlike other proxy groups, and they're ideologically motivated to strike against Israeli targets beyond just following orders from Tehran. But nonetheless, the Houthis' actions are inextricably linked to the actions of Iran, not just its support of Hamas in Gaza, but of Hezbollah in Lebanon and a range of militias in Iraq. In yet another wrinkle to this story, Iran carried out its own missile strikes in northern Iraq on January the 15th, killing four and injuring six in the Iraqi Kurdish capital of Erbil in what is claimed was a strike against a headquarters for Israel's Mossad intelligence agency. In Yemen, fears have increased that an outright war with the West might soon be possible. Yemen is still reeling from a decade of intense civil war and still deals with millions of people living on the brink of famine. The Houthis control Yemen's most populous areas, and whether or not the local population agrees with the Houthis' missions or their actions, they still fear that they'll personally be caught up in the crossfire if this new conflict with the West worsens. Ordinary Yemenis have begun stockpiling food and other essentials, and in a country where millions of people are already internally displaced, it's likely that more will be forced to leave their homes as airstrikes intensify. And we've got to emphasize here that the United States and the United Kingdom strikes are not broadly supported even among their own circle of allies. Canada, Australia, and a couple of other nations have been willing to provide support with Germany, South Korea, and others on record defending the attacks, but France, Spain, and Italy are all opposed, and Egypt, a critical US ally that exerts direct control over the Suez Canal, has indicated that it does not support airstrikes into Yemen, even under the current circumstances. Nonetheless, the American Biden administration has freshly redesignated the Houthi rebel group as a terrorist organization, a designation they once held before under the Trump administration, but had since been removed under pressure from human rights groups in order to enable the flow of food and medicine towards the desperate Yemeni population. An American reversal of that decision doesn't just speak to the idea that the US is prepared to take a long-term hostile position towards the Houthis, which it certainly is, it also indicates that the US will cut the cord of foreign aid to Yemen, if need be, in order to increase pressure on the Houthis despite the potential cost to human life. As for how this conflict may evolve further, it appears increasingly unlikely that the United States would put boots on the ground in Yemen, at least not in any significant or publicly acknowledged way. For a very long time, foreign powers have been reticent to intervene in Yemen, or else inherit the massive humanitarian crisis that the country deals with. Now, by its own decision to designate the Houthi rebels as terrorists, the US adds another barrier to an on-the-ground invasion. Choose to invade, and not only will the US inherit the Yemeni crisis, but it'll be on the United States to eradicate the Houthi civilian leadership structure and replace it with a more US-friendly option. If that sounds a lot like Afghanistan, there's a reason why. But it's unlikely that the American public has any appetite for such an operation. Instead, future US action is likely to come via continued and possibly broadened airstrikes. But with those airstrikes forced to rely on hastily gathered intelligence, the risk of collateral damage increases as the list of surviving, legitimate Houthi targets gets smaller and smaller. Returning to the Houthi side of the conflict, it's unclear what exactly the group's endgame might be at this point. It's obviously reasonable to conclude that the Houthis have chosen to continue their missile and drone strikes because they feel undeterred by the American and British airstrikes they've weathered so far. It's also a possibility that they're acting because of direct orders from Iran or trying to save face in Yemen by giving the appearance that the deaths of the Houthis' own soldiers will be avenged. In the streets at Houthi rallies, the group's supporters in Yemen have been unapologetic. As rally goers in one event chanted, We don't care make it a world war. Certainly, at this stage of the conflict, neither side has truly felt the pain and horror that a war would bring. The Houthis' personnel losses are still in the low double digits, and many international analysts suspect that the group would view a larger campaign of international airstrikes as a legitimizing force for them inside the Arab world. It's less the Houthis might not survive much longer, and more the Houthis are a real resistance army trying to stand up for Gaza. So is this entire string of attacks by the Houthis just a matter of clout chasing? Mm, probably not. But we cannot understand the value of perceived legitimacy, both foreign and domestic, to a group like the Houthis. Not long ago, the Afghan Taliban were in the same situation. Now the world has no choice but to accept them. If that's the Houthis' true endgame, then certainly their conduct thus far would make a good deal more sense. And now we'll pivot to the frozen battlefields of Ukraine, where amidst the second bitter winter of Russia's ongoing invasion, Ukraine has notched up one of its most significant aerial victories since the war began. On Sunday the 14th of January, the commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces, General Valery Zaluzhny, revealed that Ukraine had shot down two Russian aircraft. 
but not just any two. Far from just another Su-25 attack plane, the sort of aircraft that's been dropping like flies since the war began, these were highly valuable Russian warplanes that filled critical roles in Russia's air offensive. One was a Beriev A-50, an airborne early warning and control plane. The other was an Aleutian IL-22, an airborne command center. Now, the exact circumstances under which the aircraft were brought down is unknown at the time. However, General Zaluzhny gave at least some indication. Specifically, a video he included in his social media post which showed two targets disappearing while in flight over the Azov Sea, just north of the Crimean Peninsula. How the planes were targeted, whether by surface-to-air missile systems like the American-made Patriot, by Ukraine's own aircraft, or by other means, is unknown. One detail that has been provided by Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Inat was that the Beriev A-50 plane was Ukraine's primary target in whatever operation did take place. Russian state media and the Kremlin itself have been quiet on the subject, although Russian military bloggers have stated that both the A-50 and the IL-22 came under friendly fire and that the IL-22 was able to successfully land. Ukraine's chief of military intelligence, Krylo Budanov, has since confirmed that the IL-22 was able to survive despite sustaining serious damage, while the A-50 was shot down and exploded. Photos that purportedly depict the IL-22's tail have since circulated online, and if those photos are legitimate, then that IL-22 has taken some heavy damage, at least to the parts of it that we can see. Now, let's try and put into perspective just how major of a loss these two planes would be for the Russian military. If, of course, we're accepting the premise that the A-50 has been destroyed and the IL-22 has been substantially damaged, as both sides seem to indicate. Partially, these are really difficult planes for Russia to lose because of the feats that they're capable of. In the case of the A-50, the plane uses a flight crew of five and a mission crew of 10 to 15 people in total to operate a massive radar dome mounted on the top of the plane, similar to the US and NATO's E-3 Sentry. The dome is able to detect ballistic missiles from up to 800 kilometers away, bombers from 650 miles away, and fighter jets and warships as far as 300 kilometers away, meaning that they provide an incredible level of situational awareness for Russia's warfighters. The plane can track over 200 aerial targets at once, while guiding friendly fighter jets through operations and maintaining constant contact with the command center. Because it's an airborne radar system, it can detect Ukrainian aircraft flying low to the ground in attempts to avoid land-based radar systems, and it's largely understood to be a highly advanced plane by global standards, more than capable of carrying out its mission role. The IL-22 is a command post that's expected to carry a rather high-ranking Russian commanders, relaying information to the front lines both in the air and on the ground in order to control the battlefield from a distance. To have both planes brought down not only represents a potential loss of high-ranking and effective personnel, but some serious operational capability. It's unclear just how much Russian forces on Ukraine's front lines were relying on these two planes, but considering the degree to which the A-50 can extend awareness across the battlefield and the implicit expectation that a command post plane would be operating in a command post role, there's a strong possibility that these losses will be difficult for Russia to stomach. And for Russia, this situation only gets worse when we factor in just how few of each of these aircraft Moscow has at its disposal. In the case of the A-50, Russia has 14 in service, at least on paper, but Western intelligence analysts suggest that in reality, Russia's only got nine of them. That's prior to the airframe loss of the A-50 in question, which of course would lower the overall count to eight. The UK's Ministry of Defense suggests that the number of functioning A-50s could have been as low as six, putting Russia down at five in wake of Sunday's news. Other estimates are even worse. Just two remaining flyable A-50s after this attack because the remaining six are in need of upgrades and maintenance that they haven't gotten or can't get. Making matters worse, for as few A-50s as there are, there are even fewer crews trained to operate their complex mission equipment, meaning that the loss of an entire trained crew will be even tougher to replace. The true number of IL-22s is harder to place, with various news sources estimating anywhere from 12 to 30. But regardless, it's a very expensive plane to have to replace, and if the photo circulating of the IL-22's purported tail is any indication, then this plane will be in need of replacement, or at the very least, super intensive repairs. When it comes to just how big of a loss these two aircraft are to Moscow's war effort, we've got to stress that this, by itself, is not nearly enough to cripple the Russian offensive. It's a serious setback, and as we're about to discuss, it's going to require Russia to make sacrifices in order to compensate. But the loss of these two planes will almost certainly not precipitate a collapse of the Russian front lines. Instead, the level of pain these losses inflict upon Russia comes from how Russia structures its strategic operations. 
Unlike NATO star militaries, who emphasize placing the decision making responsibilities of the battlefield onto the shoulders of commanders on the ground, Russia prefers to centralize its military command at headquarters located far away from the fighting. Not only that, but its Russian ground forces, who give orders to its air forces, a chain of command for which aircraft like the IL 22 are vital in order to relay orders from headquarters to the front lines. Aircraft like the A-50 are vital to provide the information that gets sent to those headquarters before decisions are sent back and relayed to the troops on the ground. Because of how complex this whole command chain is, Russia's military is more susceptible than most global militaries to being hurt badly by losses of command and control aircraft. Without such aircraft, a NATO division of troops might keep on fighting under their own command, while a Russian division is, by the Russian military's own design, functionally paralyzed until someone new starts giving orders. And there's another layer of complexity to all of this, specifically how the loss of one highly valuable airframe will impact Russia's decisions on how to replace it with another. Although it's still not known exactly how Ukraine hit these two aircraft, Russia analyst Tom Cooper shared his own suspicions with Forbes in the wake of the attack. According to Cooper, Ukraine may have lured the A-50 aircraft into a trap, first by striking and knocking out ground radar systems across Crimea on Saturday, January the 11th, and then waiting for Russian high command to try and address the issue by sending the A-50 closer to the front lines than it should ever have gone. By taking the action they believed would prevent a larger Ukrainian air attack, Russia fed one of their own A-50s into Ukraine's more, and they happened to send an IL-22 into the trap with it. Coming that close to Ukraine would have put both aircraft in range of Ukraine's southernmost of its three Patriot surface-to-air batteries, which Cooper contends might have been how they hit it. Also possible is that Ukraine may have deployed other surface-to-air systems and paired it with an S-300 radar system, or even paired up a Soviet-made S-300 with the American Patriot system directly. Supporting Cooper's theory, the reports from Russian bloggers that a Russian fighter may have spotted an S-300 battery switching its radar on just minutes before the two Russian planes were hit, meaning that in response, a hidden Patriot battery nearby would have powered up its radar for just long enough to get its targeting data, fired off its missiles, and powered down before Russia would have detected its radar emissions in the first place. With that, the Russian planes would have had barely a minute before being struck by incoming missiles, which it appears they were. And it's here that Russia is faced with a rather difficult question. How willing are they to bring another of their very few remaining A-50s within range of Ukrainian SAMs? This is a very tough bind for Russia, who, as we mentioned, are already dealing with Ukrainian attacks that have knocked out much of their radar coverage across Crimea. With that coverage gone, Crimea is at risk to be struck much more easily by Ukrainian missiles or attacked by low-flying Ukrainian warplanes. Send along an A-50, and Crimea will be illuminated by Russian radar again, but Ukraine has already proven that A-50s that come close enough to provide coverage to Crimea are also within range to be shot down. Worse yet, Ukraine may have a reliable way of hitting it without being hit back, if the theory we just presented holds any merit. So if you're Russia, what do you choose? Do you leave Crimea a sitting duck, opening the possibility of a cascading assault that could work its way up through Crimea, through southern Ukraine, and even up to the Donbass? Or do you throw another A-50 into the fight, and possibly another after that, holding down the fort temporarily, but taking the risk that you might end up without radar coverage on Crimea and without any A-50s left? You see, this breaking news comes at a critical time for Ukraine, with morale dropping low on its front lines and few targets to attack that would confer any real gains onto Ukraine in the war. Not only that, but with Western support for the national resistance dropping rapidly, it's these sorts of battlefield victories that show potential financial and military backers that Ukraine's ongoing defense still has some legs. Now it'll be on Russia to make the next move, and it'll be on Ukraine to show that it can capitalize on whatever Russia does do in response. But if it can achieve that, either by launching larger scale attacks in Crimea or bringing down another A-50, then Ukraine might just get some momentum again. And finally, Let's talk about those Mexican drone strikes. Now, when the story broke, it initially looked like the start of a bloody new chapter in the big depressing book of cartel violence. On January the 6th, news filtered out from the small community of Heladoro Castillo in Mexico's Guerrero state that something terrifying had gone down. According to the human rights group Minerva Bello Center, the La Familia Mijoasana cartel had attacked the village, killing as many as 30 people. But it wasn't just the death toll that was worrying, it was also the method. According to initial results, the massacre had been carried out using drones. If the death toll was confirmed, that would have made it the deadliest drone attack ever conducted by a drug gang. Thankfully, later reports suggested the death toll had been exaggerated. Guerrero state prosecutors claimed that they had evidence of only five charred bodies. Still, 
The incident makes a good jumping off point for something that we think is necessary to talk about. Something currently not receiving that much attention in the wider media landscape, despite the work of dedicated reporters. And that's the way that Mexico's cartels are carrying out increasingly powerful drone strikes against their enemies. Although drug gangs have been using drones as weapons since at least 2017, it's only been in the last couple of years that they fully grasped their devastating power. As recently as 2021, Inside Crime was able to write, quote, Bomb-strapped drones are the latest spectacular tactic employed by Mexico's crime groups to capture headlines. But the drones are limited in their ability to cause damage. A mere three years later, that's no longer the case. Not only are weaponized consumer drones now able to unleash devastation, but their use is also increasing across the country. In late August, the Mexican army released its data on explosive attacks carried out by cartels so far that year. Along with a small number of car bombs, they recorded 260 incidents of drones being used to deliver explosives. That compared with an official tally of zero back in 2019, and it may still have been an undercount. A CBS reported, quote, Even that number may be an underestimate. Residents in some part of the western state of Michoan say that attacks by bomb-dropping drones are a near-daily occurrence. Go looking online, and it soon becomes clear how big of a problem this is. Rather than just dropping bombs, the drones also record the carnage they're unleashing. That footage then often appears on social media as a form of cartel propaganda. In 2022, video taken by the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, or CJNG from its Spanish spelling, detailed such an attack on a shantytown. As flowers of fire bloom on the ground, the image shows civilians running in terror, unable to fight back, unable to do anything but flee. For people like us who spend way too much time following various wars, what's perhaps most shocking is how the video looks like it could have come from the battlegrounds of Ukraine. Documenting, as it does, a level of violence we usually associate with interstate armed conflicts. For tens of thousands of Mexicans, though, moments like these are just a fact of life. In a recent article for Inkstick Media, political scientist Gabriel Mondragon Toledo covered the rise of narco drones in the state of Guerrero, a rise he partially attributed to the state's complicated geography. As one of his interviewees describes, it is a zone filled with mountains, hills, where there is a natural barrier, which is a river. Therefore, the only way to affect local residents was shooting from the hills and launching bombs with drones. Another factor is the need to drive witnesses away from remote drug smuggling routes and illegal mining sites, a task drones excel at. Just last May, Insight Crime reported bomb-laden drones destroying so many houses in Nuevo Poblado, El Caracol, that up to 600 residents were forced to flee. Clearly, using these devices is giving the cartels a reach beyond anything they've had before. All of which means it's perhaps time that we discussed what exactly these drones are. Now, the first thing to note is that these are thankfully not military-grade weapons by any stretch of the imagination. Instead, the majority of them are cheapish consumer models that have been purchased online, often from China. Once in Mexico, they're modified by the cartels to carry and drop small explosive charges. The pioneers of this approach were the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, who began using them to attack rival gangs as early as 2017. Yet while the drones may be cheap, they're also capable of doing some serious damage, including setting up a specialized group of 12 men known as the drone operators. Three years on, and the operators are so good at their jobs that our pace was able to write of their attacks that, quote, the air raids have become a common way of demonstrating firepower more associated with a professional army. That is not hyperbole. Right now, Ukraine and Russia are both using commercial drones modified in precisely this way on the battlefield because of the versatility they offer and the damage that they can do. While no cartel could ever hope to match the tens of thousands of drones both Kiev and Moscow are saturating the front lines with, they also don't need to. When your targets are small villagers with no electronic jamming equipment, a mere handful will do the job. The good news is that those in power seem to be waking up to the dangers posed by narco drones. In September of 2023, the Mexican Congress passed a law setting up a prison term of 60 years for anyone using a drone for illegal activities. The Mexican army, meanwhile, has started investing in anti-drone jamming technology. Even China has got an attack together. Worried about their use in the Ukraine war, Beijing recently introduced restrictions on manufacturers exporting commercial drones. Restrictions that have also applied to those headed for Mexico. In other words, this is not a problem that people in positions of authority are unaware of. The bad news is that it's a problem that could soon get much worse. Back in 2021, War on the Rocks wrote about how Mexico's cartels were in the middle of an arms race against their competitors. It's from this arms race that CJNG's use of drones first emerged. It's also why other cartels like Familia Michoacana have been forced to develop their own drone program in response. It's this escalatory logic that makes things so dangerous. 
In any arms race, the need to counter your opponent leads to weapons of increasing sophistication. Think how the US and Soviet Union went in barely a decade from plane-carried atom bombs to missile-mounted thermonuclear warheads that could wipe out all life on Earth. Well, something similar is happening on a much smaller scale with Mexico's cartels. Forced to innovate, their weaponry and tactics are becoming more powerful and more complex. Just three years ago, drone strikes were mostly for show. Today, they're used to depopulate entire villages. Who knows what scale they might be at in three years' time. Speaking to the Daily Beast, researcher John P. Sullivan described how, quote, the significance of the institutionalization of weaponized aerial drones by criminal armed groups can, as a result, present a more profound threat to the state and its security forces, end quote. In his telling, it might only be a matter of time before such weapons are used against law enforcement or to kill custom and border patrol officials. Whether or not that comes to pass, there's no doubting that increased drone use by cartels represents a significant threat, one that, right now, is confined to Mexico's remotest regions, but also one that may, someday soon, zero in on targets much closer to home.